Hello and welcome to Jeskai Month here on Gemstone Mine. I'm John, and today we're kicking things off with another hot brew. Our series on Gemstone Mine, where we talk with some of the brewers in the CDH metagame about the decks they're working on, which are not your typical deck list database or average tournament fare. If you're looking for some spice for your CDH deck box, or you're just CDH curious and you want to see if the format has something unique to offer, then one of these hot brews might just be for you. But before I get started, I just wanted to thank everybody who made Azorius Month our best yet on Commander Cookout Media Group. And thank you to everyone who came out to see all of us, Brando and Ryan and Mac at MagicCon Chicago. If you're enjoying the episodes we're doing, it's a big help to give us a like or a subscribe on your app of choice and leave a comment to let us know how we're doing. And since we're part of CCO Media Group, that means we're brought to you by FusionGamingOnline.com, your source for all your gaming needs. If any of the spicy includes in today's hot brew, or any of those top-notch control cards from Azorius Month sound like cards you want to buy anyway, why not pick them up at Fusion? You can get those cards with a discount of 5% off if you use the coupon code on your screen right now, or in the description if you're in an audio-only format. And yes, Fusion does ship international. I live down here in Florida, and they managed to get cards to me still relatively quickly from the Great White North. That's FusionGamingOnline.com, your source for all your gaming needs. And now, without further ado, I'll kick things over to Pass John with the brewer behind this week's hot brew interview on... Why does this thing never work when I... Today, I am joined by Callahan of the Mind Sculptors, who has a pretty <laughs> interesting deck that I am pretty sure they are excited to talk about today. Yes. So, Callahan, welcome to Gemstone Mine. Welcome. Thank you for having me back. I think it was on, like, it was like over a year ago, I think, uh, uh, with you, and it's uh, that... good to be back. It's a... Uh, one of my favorite people in the community, so. Aw, thanks, Cal. That was back during your your Survivor kick. Is that still yeah, going well, on, by the way? Oh, it's absolutely still going on. Yes. <laughs> it, is, it is. Every every chance I get to talk about that uh, analogy, I take it. But uh, I, it feels less like a fringe idea these days and more like uh, what people have kind of accepted more and more, uh, which is nice because... Uh, took a lot of, uh, had a lot of pushback from people being like, oh, it's not like Survivor. Or, or, or. <laughs> We're well, cool today, that. well, today you brought a really cool deck that I know you have been excited to talk about. I think I've seen a version of this deck, although not in this color identity. Mm -hmm. And first, before we get into that, though, mm -hmm. I mentioned where you're from. Why don't you tell us the more extensive list of your, uh, let's call them your credentials right now. Where can people oh, find cool. you? Where do they know you from? Uh, so most people would know me from <clears throat> Mind Sculptors. I uh, founded that back in 2020, and uh, which is shocking. That has been almost four years. Um, and then, uh, you know, I founded that with uh, Cobblepot and then like Pongo and people in like the Into the North people were involved in it for a while. And uh, right now it is mostly just me and uh, my best friend uh, Ian, otherwise known as Comedian MTG. And we do it weekly where we kind of have pivoted into being like full on like tournament coverage. Uh, where we are breaking down the metagame, going over numbers and results, and kind of breaking down exactly what to expect and giving our take on what we kind of think are the best things in the format right now, uh, which are our most like popular videos by like a long shot is our Power Rankings episodes. So uh, that's, that's probably where most people know me from. I've also done, uh, I did a couple seasons of uh, the MLC, uh, back in 2021 and 2022. Uh, and I also like work, I, I run the uh, rules committee streams on Thursday nights. So if you're a frequent flyer there, you've probably heard me giving Scott and Toby and Gavin a hard <laughs> time. Uh, you know, I, I also... Uh, produce and edit the uh, Scry Babies content, 
and I do some some other like content management for some other people, but like a lot of what I do is just like you know, sitting in this office and working and uh, making sure that content is about the best it can be right now. So with with the tools that I have, I, I, I had a computer die on me a few weeks ago and I had to upgrade to a, I got a Mac studio and it was genuinely revolutionary. I changed my life forever. So we've uh, lost, we've lost you to the Apple side of the world. Oh, I've had a Mac for like five years. Uh, the the big difference now is I have a Mac that's built for what I do. Uh, and so the uh, speed at which I am able to accomplish work is significantly faster than what it once was, <laughs> which is a truly nice thing. So That's pretty sweet. I got to say, time, time matters. Time matters. Yeah, it really does. When I mean, videos that were taking me like four hours to mix down now take me like 15 minutes which is like wonderful like having there are two dedicated rendering units within the the computer like it's just it's it's like everything i could have asked for it's amazing well this isn't a mac <laughs> podcast, but, uh, sorry but uh, i i after it, it was like a full year of just fighting my old mac constantly with work and then I, a few like about a month ago, I got this PC or this this Mac, and I was just like, "Oh my goodness, what have I been doing?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know that pain though. I had to finish an episode recently, and I had let's see, I set it to go, and I set an alarm to wake myself up at about one in the morning to make sure I could get it uploaded. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, anyway, so outside of all of your work and content creation, you also occasionally find time to play CDH. I do, how, yeah. How would you describe your gameplay and deck building style? Uh, I am... So you know how like everybody's describing the meta right now as like mid-range hell? This is not my hell. This is my hell. <laughs> I'm very happy. This is like my ideal games of magic. I have been having so much fun. Uh, I I really my my deck of choice these days has been Tivit. I have been playing a lot of Tivit lately. Um, I've done pretty okay with it. I've uh, top four SCG Columbus, top sixteen SCG Cincinnati, um, and so like it, it's treated me well. Uh, but th that's generally what I, I, I have been playing over the past like year. I've also, uh, you know, I, I used to play Thrasios and Timna and I used to play Najila and I used to like, I've, uh, like people would also know me from being in, like running the Lavinia deck for a very long time. And so it's just like, I've been on a lot of stuff. I like control. I like mid range. And, uh, so that's kind of where I've. I've fallen through the years. Uh, it seems like something you're relatively happy with, especially kind of glancing over the list that we're going to talk about today. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about and kicking off Jeskai Month this month, as Callahan is going to tell us about their brew with Arden, Krom, Stoneblade? Was that yeah. what yeah. you Yeah, I, I call it Jeskai Stoneblade. Um, All right, is... so... Uh, why, why don't we start then? Yeah. Why Arden? What does Arden offer when you're looking at it from, at it from a CDH perspective? So I think when you are evaluating CEDH commanders, there's like three things you look for in what your commander does, right? You kind of want your commander to do one of three things. You either want it to provide some sort of card advantage or mana advantage, right? We're talking uh -huh. about Timna. We're talking about Malcolm. Uh, those sorts of cards, or even Krom, right? Like, there's a uh -huh. reason Timna Krom is so good, is it's just, here is all the card advantage of the world in the best colors. Uh -huh. um, and so that's really good. Or you want it to be an outlet that also lets you kind of grind value throughout the game. I'm talking about, you know, the Thrasioses, the Kinnons, the Kenriths, those sorts of things. Although mm -hmm. Kinnon kind of fits into, these aren't perfect categories. Kinnon fits into a lot of these. But uh, Kinnon kind of is that like value outlet sort of commander, I would say mostly. 
Um, and then the final one are wing cons in the command zone. So stuff like Najila or Goto or to some extent Tivit, right? Those mm-hmm. are win conditions in the command zone that are there to facilitate winning the game above everything else. And so one of the things that I like about Arden a lot is that it kind of does a lot of those things at the same, or yeah, a couple of those things at the same time, specifically uh, through card or mana advantage. It's not necessarily like very plain to notice right off the bat, uh, but it is there and I'll explain in a moment. And it also provides a access as a piece of the win condition in the deck, which is primarily uh, centered around Goto, Bandit, Warlord, and Helm of the Host. And uh, Arden allows you to cheat that cost and just get it down and go. Um, so you don't have to count to 11. You at most have to count to f- six. If you're really... Honestly, if you're paying six for Goto in this deck, you've done something wrong. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that that's a big part of it. Now, uh, when I talk about the card or mana advantage, this is where I kind of get people looking at me a little weird. Um, and so a, a, a big part of why we don't see equipment played in command or in CEDH uh, the same way that we would in a modern format. Modern's much different now, uh, or legacy. When we think about those formats uh, of of the past, or even even in regular commander, right? Is equip costs are an additional cost on top of the cast cost to do to get any value out of them, right? In right. order to get extract value from sort of fire and ice. I need to pay three mana and two mana, not just three mana. Arden allows you to cheat that cost. Uh, And doing that makes it so that those cards now become super playable, right? Uh, Cards that we already play several things that it's like when you... uh, You know, deal combat damage, draw a card, right? We have a Timna. Uh, we do things like that. Uh, Jitte is a like notoriously powerful card, right? It's been banned from formats because of how powerful it is. Um, and so it's able to do those things. But one of the like primary uh, advantage engines in the deck is actually Skull Clamp. Uh, the interaction that Arden has with Skull Clamp is incredibly parasitic. <laughs> and... Uh, Also very powerful. Uh, So if you're unfamiliar with how Arden works, the way it reads is at the beginning of combat on your turn, you may attach any number of auras and equipment you control to target permanent or player. So uh, if you have a skull clamp out and somebody has, let's say, I I don't know, I can't think of any X ones right now, Norkish Bowmaster. That's or probably rag- why you can't think of any extra Yeah, I can't right think now. of any right now. You know, but let's say they have a Ragavan out, or an Orcish Bowmasters, or a Rograk, or a Najila and a Warrior, right? Uh, you're going to equip, you're going to play Arden, and you're going to play Skull Clamp, and you'll go to combat, and your trigger goes on the stack, and you equip Skull Clamp to uh, a 1 1 on the board. It kills it and you draw two cards. That is, as we like to say in the business, a two for one. Uh, That's, hold on, that's three it's, for it's one? A, yeah, you get a lot of, uh, dan- you get a lot out of it. Um, obviously, not everything in the format is an X1, so it's not a perfect uh, solution, but that's also why we have things like Sword of Fire and Ice and Jitte, so that you can... Uh, get even more value out of it. And, you know, SoFi also just has, like, its own value that it adds to the equation, right? Uh, So you have those things. The other thing that is very unique with this deck is Arden's uh, particular interaction with Helm of the Host. And part of why I like uh, Arden so much is this interaction. Okay, let's walk through this then. So... 
Helm of the, so, so one of the things that Ian and I talk about a lot on our show, and I think has kind of been proven correct throughout a lot of the term, ter, ter, tournament data that we have gathered, right? And you look at a lot of the deck lists that are getting played these days. Uh, clones are in. Clones are the hot shit. That, that's what's in. Like, if, if you're doing anything correct, you are playing at least a Phyrexian Metamorph probably also a flesh duplicate. Um, Helm of the Host in this deck is effectively a third copy of that that also can be a, or is part of your win condition. Um, so Helm of the Host, it, for those who are unfamiliar with it, is at the beginning of combat on your turn, create a token that's a copy of equipped creature, except that token isn't legendary if equipped creature is legendary and this token ga gains haste. So an interesting thing about this card is is that trigger goes on the stack whether it is equipped or not. So if it is equipped to a creature or not, that trigger goes on the stack. So the way it is worded and the way Arden is worded is you can stack those triggers. So that Helm of the Host is on the bottom of the stack. Arden is on the top of the stack. So Arden's re uh, resolves first. You put Helm of the Host on whatever the best creature on the table is. Uh, we could be talking about Atraxa. I'm talking about Dockside. I'm talking about Timna. I'm talking about all these really good creatures that we see play right now. Like one of the things that's huge right now are creatures are super good and they're probably the best that they've ever been in this format. Uh, Helm of the Host lets you take advantage of that in a way that other clones can't because not only is it a clone it's a repeatable clone so you're not just making okay there's an attraction that i gained I, I got a bunch of cards off of it right next turn i'm gonna do it again and the turn after that i'm gonna do it again and it's repeatable and th this is the other thing that i think is like genuinely shocking about it it is if you copy somebody's Atraxa or you pay for the Tivit, right, on that on that trigger, um, they're non-legendary. You can keep them around. So they they just they're sticky too. That's the other part okay. of it that I think is really important to to keep with that. With it, a lot of these effects, you know, like Finage kind of Phantasmal Image kind of fell off, right, mm -hmm. because of the fact that it didn't have that stickiness. It's a big reason why Flush Duplicate kind of took its spot and really rose to the top, right? It's mm -hmm. a big reason why Phyrexian Metamorph uh, was... Just making a comeback. Yeah, exactly. Like, Phyrexian Metamorph, really before Duplicate came out, was kind of replacing, uh, f uh, what was it, Finage. And now that we've got that, a lot of people went, what if we just play both? And, <laughs> and, and so that's kind of the thing. But it's because of how sticky they are. They get on the board and then you... they. They hang around. They keep doing a thing. That's what Helm of the Host does, right? Is it makes the copy, and then it can make more copies. And if a new thing comes out that you want to copy, hey, guess what, baby? You can move that bad boy. And so if you want to copy your own thing, you can move it to that. So there's just there's a lot of those cool interactions like that that you can't really do in other decks. It's a very unique thing. And I think it's interesting because in a lot of cases... I think that in CDH, for example, people look at Helm of the Host and go, oh, they're, th those go away at the end of turn, right? I mean, you kill us all with Godo, mm -hmm. so obviously they're, they're copies, they just go away. And, or, for example, in Casual, well, wait, what do you mean? My creature died, why do you get to draw the two cards off of Skull Clamp? Yeah. And there's just some unintuitive things which catch a lot of people by surprise, in my it's, experience. It's very much the type of deck that is taking advantage of no like you get to take advantage of knowing the rules well uh in a way that like not necessarily one-to-one -one, but if you remember like lantern control with kci or not not lantern control it was kci specifically that combo deck in modern it wasn't necessarily banned because it was too strong it was banned mostly because of the fact that it was just like really hard for people to understand and it was also leading to games that were, this is kind of off the topic, but like it was also leading like leading to games where like people were missing flights in tournament finals because it games would go so long. 
Um, but like a big advantage of the KCI deck in modern was you were doing things that the rules allowed, but are so like specific to what you are doing that you really only know about it if you're doing that thing. Um, and so that's what a really cool rules interaction that you like that you get to do that. And obviously this is not nearly as like devastatingly broken as the KCI stuff was in modern, but it works in that similar way of you're doing things with the rules that people aren't necessarily really ready for or used to. Uh, and it's just, it, it is absolutely incredible the amount of things that you can do with Arden and just a helm of the host. Like you can, I, I have, I have made uh, Arden, uh, copies of Arden, so that you can pass around what you're doing. And so you can do those oh. things. And it doesn't work with Helm of the Host necessarily where you can make multiple copies, but you're able to kind of use one trigger to put something here. You could put another trigger to put something there. Uh, or you can skull clamp multiple things. Because once it goes on, it checks and boom, State it's gone. Space action. Yeah. Oh, so God. you can do interactions <laughs> with that that you can't do anywhere else in Magic except right here. And that's one of the things that I think is just truly wonderful about it is you are in, and honestly, like it's it's a Jeskai deck. It's going like if I'm a level with you, right? Like you're going to run into certain issues because of that. But that's also why we play Crom in the command zone. So uh, why don't why don't we talk about our partner then? Let's talk about Crom because yeah. cat's out of the bag. It's Jeskai month. Yeah, it is. It is. It is a Jeskai month and it's a Jeskai deck. And really, what it comes down to is, like I said, a lot of that core combo is Arden, Godo, Helm. That's a big piece of that central combo. Mm -hmm. And uh, choosing Crom is as easy as well. I need a red X partner because I want a third color. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm only going to stick in two colors, the best partner for Arden is Rograk then. Because Rograk, I mean, and that sounds funny to some extent, but like it truly is because it lets you play this the, the Godo Helm strategy in a like really wickedly fast way mm -hmm. that like only Godo could replicate. Um, so when you add that third color, you kind of want the balance that uh, blue brings to the table. It's also just straightforwardly like the best partner commander that's blue and not named. Like mm. it, it's that it is blue, right? I, I think it is officially dethroned Thrasios. And like there, there is a reason Tim Nacrom is like month after month my best deck in the format, right? It performs better than every deck in the format, better on par or on average, better than even the second best deck in the format by like multiple percentile like points. So we're talking about like, it's like 10 points better than the second best deck. Right. Which is it, like, if that was happening in modern, we would be like genuinely like shocked. Right. Like when, when scam was running uh, stuff, right. We were just like, Holy crap. And it's the same thing with Tim Nacrom. And so you got to get to tap into a little bit of that with us. So why don't we take just a couple of moments? Because I think that Krom is, at this point, well known to most CDH players. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of the casual crowd may be less experienced with Krom. And they might be looking at it going, wait a second. You're playing a five-mana commander? I thought this was CDH. What's going on? Yeah. So how, I, how, I hate how to does it to you, but big commanders are in. That's, I know. That's, that's, I know. <laughs> I play Tim, baby. Attracts is one of the best decks in the format. Big commanders are in, baby. Five com five mana ain't nothing. It that's... really isn't, especially Jeweled Lotus. But even five, before five Jeweled mana Lotus. is a turn two commander. Are you kidding me? Like that's... I know. So, what is it about Krom's uh, triggered ability that makes him such a powerful addition in the command zone? Well, I mean, it's just kind of passive card draw, right? Uh, you don't have to do anything to make Krom work, and that's a big thing that. Like, Arden is very similar to Timna in that it rewards you for doing things that your deck kind of already wants to do, right? Um, in, in different ways. Like, Timna rewards you for attacking with creatures. Arden rewards you for using equipment. And Krom, on the other hand, is just like, hey, baby, if you play me and your opponent just does two things, jackpot. And... 
that that that, that that's huge, right? Like it's just yeah. passive. It turns out that P- commander players, CDH players in particular, are gonna drop two spells a turn pretty it turns out it, pretty you comfortably. Will, you will draw anywhere <laughs> from like four to sixteen cards in a turn cycle pretty consistently. It's <laughs> like, nuts. It's it it is it it is a lot that you get out of that. And when you're talking about this mid range meta game that we're in right now, when Mystic Remora and Ristic Study are driving the format. Crom is like the next thing in line. So uh, you get that in your command zone, and that's just a huge advantage. It does make it a lot easier. And something we've not really touched upon with the other decks we've talked about in our Hot Brews series mm-hmm. has been that you have the ability to not necessarily have to worry about, oh, I got a mull to make sure I got my turn to drop for a card mm-hmm. advantage engine. You could be much more liberal with what you keep and go. Yes, this, this looks okay. Let's just go ahead and jam it. I can get a turn two crop. Yeah. Let's go, baby. And and that's like one of the things, right? You you will often hear Kinnan pilots, Tim the Crom pilots, Rogside pilots, or even Najila pilots, right? Tell you you got to mulligan aggressively. You got to mulligan aggressively. And while that is true for those decks, there are decks that don't have the advantage of getting bailed out by their commanders, right? Mm-hmm. And Chrome gives you that ability of kind of bailing you out, right? Like, there are times when you're just like, man, I guess this LED land and a mana crypt are going to have to do it. Yeah. And it's just like... like oh, wait. <laughs> There's Chrome. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what I mean. Is It's just like there are times when it's just like... I, there were three other cards in that hand that I want, but, like, I don't know. I'm mulliganing down to four, and this gets me a card draw engine. So, like, I guess... And if this gets countered, I'm boned. But like, oh well, like <laughs> what I gotta do. Uh, so yeah, I mean that's like kind of uh, one of the advantages of Chrome is that you don't have to dig nearly as deep into your mulligans. But you also it gives you that ability to dig deeper because you'll get to a like a four right, and you're just like, all right, worst case scenario, I'm casting Chrome, right. and that's like a good place to be. Mm-hmm. So why don't we now take a step back and let's talk about the strengths of this deck. Okay. You've kind of talked so far about how it kind of rewards that rules wonkiness to be mm-hmm. able to say, well, here's specifically how state-based interactions inter- interact with the beginning of combat stage. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about some other strengths of the deck. So one of the big strengths of the deck is going to be, Honestly, uh, in large part, some of what makes Tivit very successful, right, is Tivit is very successful in large part because of the fact that it is able to play two very compact uh, wing conditions. Mm-hmm. That one that is centered around, uh, in part, its commander and how its commander like functions. The other being for Tivit, you've got Thassa's Oracle, Demonic Consultation, that whole setup. Mm -hmm. And with this, you've got the Breach Package, right? And, like, I think those are very hand-in-hand the same uh, in terms of how compact they are and how necessary they are to play when you can play them. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was a period of time where Mm -hmm. I was very hard, like, man, you you can't play it because you want to be playing Graph Digger's Cage. And I think that is to some extent true, but I also think that if I'm in an Esper Colors, right, I'm not playing, like, eat. I'm not playing Torpor Orb, right? Right. Because I'm taking myself off of the best win condition in the format that lets me, Mm -hmm. on a dime, win the game. And that is something that I like. I like Cobble and I have argued about this for hours, right? Where he'll be like, "Well, you know, in the right deck," and I'm like, I, "Sure, I hear what you're saying conceptually, but when I'm in a tournament hall and I'm playing somebody, the ability to oh shit, I have it right is so huge and necessary that cutting it is like suicide almost. Like you can't do that, and you can't afford to do that. So. It's one of those things where you get that advantage of being able to play two very strong combos that are kind of hard to interact with. And, uh, like, you're also just doing this really general game plan that is, like Tivit, kind of hard to deal with. It is a control deck that kind of just 
pace outpaces you with a value attacks you on an angle that you weren't necessarily ready to deal with or used to and it just kind of does a lot of unordinary things for what you're used to in the format it's very funny that i the the other deck that i love is also kind of the other deck in the format that kind of works on this awkward angle um <laughs> Well, why don't we expand on that general game plan then? So yeah. how does a game with Arden Krom start? How does it play out? What does it look like when Arden Krom is doing the thing that it wants to do? So it, it's funny because like there used to be a time where I was like, man, you got to get that. You got to Arden down. You got to get Skull Claim down. You got to get Arden down. You got to get Skull Claim down. And these days, because of the way the metagame has shifted, a lot of my approach with this is... Land of Value Engine, have cards in hand. Mm -hmm. Land of Value Engine, have cards in hand to interact. Uh, how can I, like, with this Value Engine, does it either set me up for a win or set me up to at least buy myself a couple turns? That's what I want to have. So that's why you have, like we said earlier, we have the Krom in the Command Zone. We have Esper Sentinel. We have Archivist of Ogma. We have Trouble in Pairs, which is the newest addition it's brand spank new and this card is really freaking good uh it is a, a absurdly good it's like if mangara the diplomat didn't suck like the card is so good um brutal it, i mean it's unfortunately true i mean this is a card I that's know, going, like steam play and every is going to be a format staple 100 percent um and it, it's a huge add to this because if somebody attacks you you draw a card. Somebody, ca it's a second crom. It's mm -hmm. also if somebody draws more than one card, uh, you draw a card. Guess what? That's happening plenty. Um, so it's one of those things where there's just so many. You you want to land those engines, and I think now because of the way the metagame is shaped into this mid range plant and engine and kind of. Uh, figure it out like you want to land your Ristic study and you kind of hide behind a Ristic study because of that you get to do that in this deck as well and then you get to land these artifacts that are very powerful and are going to make the game quite difficult for your opponents if they land all right, let's then talk about some of those, because I mm -hmm. think a lot of the cards we're going to talk about now, some of the unique includes in mm -hmm. Ard and Krom, are cards that are probably a little bit more familiar to the casual side of the audience. Yeah. But wh why don't we start with just equipment in general? You yeah. already commented on, hey, here are here's something that sees play in other formats, but that second cost, that equip cost, that you, we get to cheat with Ard right. in the command zone, it changes the math on how it works. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the key pieces of equipment? We've already mentioned Skull Clamp, and you talked a little bit about Sword of Fire and Ice. Yeah, um, so Skull Clamp is obviously pretty uniquely good for reasons we've already kind of laid out. Helm of the Host in a similar way, where mm -hmm. it is a combo piece and also a, a value engine of sorts. Uh, Sword of Fire and Ice uh, is really strong in that it gives it buffs your commander and or whatever it's attached to. Generally, it's a Crom. If I'm being completely honest, generally put it on a Crom, and you're like, all right, deal with the seven seven that's pro blue and red, and also draws cards. Figure that one out, and uh, that is a pretty good place to be. <laughs> That's why, um, but it, it's really good because it's kind of board control in a similar way that Skull Clamp is right. Like you deal combat damage, and then you ping something down. Mm -hmm. So it lets you be able to kind of answer multiple things if you really need to, and also is card advantage again as well. Uh, Umazawa's Jate is just absurd. <laughs> The card is stupid. Mm -hmm. You don't need to have it equipped to mm -hmm. use the ability at all. It just has to have charge counters. So even if they remove the creature that it was attached to, if you got charge counters on it, you're good, baby. It don't matter. And I, so you this, always you always have enough charge counters. You always have enough charge counters. And again, we're living in a bowmaster's world. So being able to just say no to somebody's bowmasters is huge. It's so huge. Being able to gain, uh, like, to buff, like, your the creature it's attached to can be the difference between winning this turn and next turn. 
uh, in the true life can be relevant. I, I've never seen that one be super relevant here um, in this particular deck, but I'm not willing to say that it would never be relevant. There's a lot of angles that you will always find that maybe there's a weird game that's super grindy and you needed the extra two life. I don't know. Live your best life. But like that, that is a thing that can happen. Um, and then the the last equipment that the deck plays, or that my list plays specifically, is sort of Feast from Famine. This card could really be a variety of different things, and it kind of comes is this a big flex slot. I generally like a sword that gives you pro black in mm -hmm. this slot. Uh, there's a couple of different options there. Sort of Feast and Famine for my play style fits really well because of the fact that it lets me untap my lands. So being able to plant this, put it on something, attack, untap, lets you kind of get a lot of extra value that you wouldn't be getting otherwise. And so it lets you kind of be okay tapping out for a turn because you're untapping your car stuff immediately. Right, right. The same basic theory behind, okay, we're the control deck, so it, we're we have to be responsible. Right. We have to be the one who's ready to interact, and, and we got to pay the mana for our counterspells sometimes. And the other thing, so. too, is, is like, I play this in a very controlly way. There is another build of this that can exist that is super proactive, that plays, plays stuff like Commander or Conqueror's Foil, right? Mm-hmm. You can play stuff like Dousing Dagger so that you get, like, effectively a Black Lotus that never goes away. <laughs> and, like, that's really good. And so, like, if you're wanting to play it in a more proactive way, you can do that, too. And it will be, it will also work. And it will also do a lot of those things because guess what? Dousing Dagger, when you put it on a Crom, doesn't care that your opponent has two plant tokens. <laughs> Turns out when you can go over the top, it just doesn't matter. Uh, Conqueror's Flail, obviously, I mean, it's these, it depends on the brew or on the person, but sees play and stuff like Rogsai and like low color or non white, uh, like turbo decks tend to play like this in addition to like a, um, defense grid, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so you can do that. Also, if you're in a meta game where something like a Gilded Drake is more, uh, like reasonable, I would suggest playing something along the lines of Sword and Hearth and Home. Uh, and the reason for that is a Sword of Hearth and Home has one of the dumbest abilities with Gilded Drake mm -hmm. that exists in it. It baffles me to this day as to why it's worded as it oh, a creature worded, you own. It's worded so specifically to work with Gilded Drake. It's offensive. Uh, so the way it is worded is whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, exile up to one target creature you own. Then search your library for a basic land card, put both cards onto the battlefield under your control, then shuffle. Uh, the, the difference between own and control is monumental. So you gilded Drake somebody's Atraxa or whatever, right? Whatever the big problem child at the table is or the thing you want um let's say the Dranith for whatever uh you put this on your crom hit somebody with it flicker that gilded drake hey baby you got another creature for free mm -hmm. like and you gotta land if you want to tool your deck that way you don't really have to and i tried it and it's not really worth worrying about the basic land part of it uh i think it is a little too much of an edge case and a little too hard to set up Mm -hmm. in Jeskai, which is why I don't play it. Uh, specifically because it's just, like, it's kind of too many moving parts in these colors to reliably play, and there's not enough other good ETBs in this that I feel like I get the most advantage out of it on its own. And so this is kind of coming back to where I really, my, my deck building style is very, like, uh, very holistic in the sense that I want all of my cards to, if this is the only card that I have for turn, is this going to be good? And so there's a reason, and granted, I play some stuff that I don't love in that isn't good at that. Like Brain Freeze isn't great as your only spell for turn, or Rite of Flame, Loyal Retainers. There are a handful that are kind of meh, 
on their own. And you have to play those. But when Ooh. you're core wait, wait a piece, did sorry, did you ahead. just did you just say you've got loyal retainers in the stack? Have loyal retainers in the stack, yes. Okay. <sighs> I, I usually am not one to judge, and I definitely bought an Invocation Loyal Retainers back in the early days of Razakats. But, Callahan, I'm going to have to ask you to explain. <laughs> Why is there a Loyal Retainers in your deck? <laughs> yes, please. That's uh, yeah. a much nicer way to put it. <laughs> uh, so, one of the one of the big like hurdles that I found with this deck when I was brewing it like several years ago was, how do I reliably get Goto Helm in hand... Mm -hmm. at the same time, or how do I get Goto onto the battlefield reliably, right? Right, right. Um, that is the biggest issue in Jeskai, because Jeskai, fun fact, doesn't tutor creatures terribly well. No, unless uh, it's an artifact creature, you've got nothing going for you. Yeah, or, and, or a goblin, I guess. But and, and the other layer to that, too, is not only, like, and the stuff that could potentially tutor like a a Godo, Godo is too big for. So like mm -hmm. either recruiter doesn't get the job done here. And so what I found was, is I was playing a bunch of like multiple other bad cards. So you could like tutor chain your way into mm -hmm. it. Whereas with loyal retainers, you get this really compact intuition pack package. All right. We've where... talked about intuition packages before, and yes. the idea being that you can present a pile that says, okay, doesn't matter what you pick, what you I got the me. win here. Exactly. Um, and so the deck, this is probably one of my favorite intuition decks in the format because it has so many freaking intuition piles. And that's a very intentional, and again, because I'm a very, I, I think about things very layered, so it's like, okay, they took out the helm line, where am I, how am I pivoting? And intuition gives you multiple different aspects. Obviously, you have the classic Underworld Breach LED Savine's Rec pa package. That is the most direct, easy access mm -hmm. version of it. The other version that you, or the other package that with loyal retainers is you get Goto, loyal retainers, and Savine's Reclamation. So no matter what they give you, you're getting a Goto somehow. So if okay. okay, uh if if they put Goto in the yard and they give you Savine's wreck, you mm -hmm. Savine's wreck the loyal retainers, sack the royal retainers, get Goto back. If they give you the loyal retainers, cool, one step less. If they give you Goto, cool. I'm casting Goto. Mm -hmm. Like that is and that's like one of the things where people are like, oh well you still have to cast Goto. And it's like, then fine, I'll cast Goto. And if they counter it, guess what? I got a backup. Mm -hmm. So it's like you that's one of the things like I kind of have a, Ian doesn't like it, but I think it's one of those things where it's like, listen, man, you if you're going to do this, you have to accept if you're willing to play a card like Ride of Flame, you have to be willing to play a card that also makes your win condition work. Listen, Demonic Consultation ain't great 99 percent of the time. It kind of sucks most of the time, if I'm going to be honest. Tainted Pact is the good one. But you still play Demonic Consultation, right? Mm -hmm. So regardless of the fact that I personally think Loyal Retainers most of the time is completely dead in this deck. I will not, like, I'm, I'm not going to lie. It is most of the time dead in the deck. But because of the fact that it, like I said earlier, lets you f see a window, take it, and go for it, that on its own means, okay, this is... I, I can't take this out because of its ability to on a dime, get me my win condition. And that is something that in this format, you have to be able to do because if you cannot, if the if window arise and you cannot take it, you, you're going to, I mean, we just had the super bowl this past week. Right. And, and what happened? The 49ers had their opportunity to take it. They couldn't get it. And what happened? They lost the game. And so, that's one of the things is when an opportunity to put the game away comes to you, you have to be able to just grab it. And this gives you that ability. Okay. So that is one of the intuition lines. And yeah. I think we were talking before, you mentioned another, I guess, a card that is not commonly seen in CDH mm -hmm. with Forge Anu as yes. another intuition line. Yeah. So this is one of the ones where I've kind of played around with, uh, playing like another helm top. I'm not super sold on it because a lot of them 
like one of the things that's nice about Godot, right, is Godot on its own is worst case scenario a to the battlefield tutor. Right. So it's like its worst case is it is cheating three mana cost onto the battlefield for me. That mm-hmm. is huge. But like that is like worst case scenario and I'm fine with that. Some of the other ones like uh I'm I'm trying like combat celebrant, right? That you would play as like secondary godos mm-hmm. kind of suck. <laughs> like mm-hmm. they're not good. And we're already kind of playing some cards that we aren't in love with to begin with. Uh, like, And you could potentially remove the Loyal Retainers and play uh, the Combat Celebrant, but then I think you're just kind of trading off I, the consistency of your, uh, of your intuition package at that point, because it's really easy to fuck up that package. Then your Goto package just straight up doesn't work. You mm-hmm. cannot intuition for a Goto then. Um, and so, uh, one of the things that you can do in this deck is you can do what I would call a value intuition. If you feel like that is going to serve you well, a a great example is if you have intuition in your hand Mm -hmm. and the window to win is not there, but there's a window to get some good value right now. And I think I can get this intuition off, but I don't feel like a Goto is going to land. Right. But I do think a goblin engineer is going to land. So what okay. you do is you intuition pile grabbing goblin engineer, mm-hmm. Savine's reclamation. A lot of these intuition piles, unsurprisingly, revolve around Savine's rec. It's the reason uh, why so many in Jess guy. Yeah. Uh, and the third card that you play is Forge Anew. And what that allows you to do is if you are given the goblin engineer, you play your goblin engineer and you put in whatever equipment you want to put onto the battlefield. Helm of the Host is a great one. Uh, Sword of Fire and Ice is another good one. Um, when you Savine's wreck back the Forge Anew, when it enters the battlefield, you return target equipment card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Ba- okay. So it returns it, so it helps cheat that cost. And that's mm-hmm. in part why I have toyed around with the idea of playing like another Helm Top. Because you do have that window and that ability mm-hmm. to, if you have like a combat celebrant or another one of the like helm tops in the, in the list um, that do the like multiple combat steps, mm-hmm. you then are able to just equip the helm and you don't even need Arden for this car- combo because Forge New also lets you pay zero for equip costs for the first one you do each turn. So what, even if it's the Godo line, Forge new also helps on that axis as well. So it's just like, it's really good to help you like sure up a lot of different, in, like a lot of the like inconsistencies the deck has had previously. And being able to do that is like a huge boon uh, and having that kind of, okay, I just kind of need a value piece right now. And Forge new being that is so good. That's awesome. Well, are there any other really interesting includes that you would say fall well outside of the purview of this EDH deck list database or the staples list? Maybe it's a card I've been pushing a lot recently. Um, it's a card that I kind of think is maybe the best white card that's printed, been printed as far as a removal piece in like almost decades is Get Lost. Okay. And... Uh, this card single-handedly made tit like brought Tivit to back from like almost dying because Tivit was in a rough place because it couldn't really answer a lot of different things. And then Get Lost got printed and you were like, huh, this just solves a lot of problems, huh? And uh, yeah, Get Lost does. does that for white decks in general, being able to destroy something. Uh, it used to be soul partition in this slot, but mm-hmm. it turns out that people still play things from exile all the time. And so uh, Get Lost just w- was a strict upgrade and uh, does a lot of good, like, uh, removal of problematic permanents that kind of get in your way. Uh, and it just kind of answers everything, right? Like, the only thing it doesn't hit is artifact and really no artifacts that we care about that True. are going to disrupt us. Like, like this is one of the things that's unique about Arden is like, if somebody plays a null rod 
or a collector oof. Like, this does deal with an oof. But if somebody plays, like, an alt null rod, you're just kind of like, okay, I guess I will not tap my soul ring to equip my sword of fire nice i guess i will use my commander that makes that free um <laughs> so it's like it, it, it there's just like a, a lot of things like that where you just don't care about like a lot of like the only stacks piece that you truly care about is graph digger's cage mm-hmm. and that's like most the format at these days right like there's only a handful of decks that don't care about graph digger's cage and i play one of them so mm-hmm. it's like i that's kind of how i feel about it i think the other unique card is stubborn denial um that is a card that I play in Tivit, and I think that every Chrom deck in America should be playing as well, mm-hmm. uh, because it is a free one mana counter spell. Yeah, uh, for yeah. or not free, but it is a, yeah, it is effectively a hard one mana counter spell that uh, you kind of get for playing your commander, which you want to do anyway. It turns out, yeah. Uh, so I, that, that's kind of my as, big... as a Narset player can confirm. Yeah, uh, Stubborn Isles, good good card. Sort Don't forget about card. it. Don't forget about uh, it. <laughs> but right. yeah, like there's not a ton of weird stuff necessarily. Like the weird stuff is like the equipment package. And I think once you kind of like conceptualize it around like the same way that Timna plays value pieces, value creatures that synergize with it, uh, this is doing a very similar thing. Makes sense. So we've talked about a lot of the strengths of the deck. Mm-hmm. Before we talk about some of the more fun stuff, why don't we kind of go through the weaknesses what are the uh, things that what Arden Krom do not want to see across the table? So one of the big things that you're going to have a hard time with is figuring out how to answer a Bowmasters. Uh, because Bowmasters is going to figure out real quick. Because you're going to be... Like, they're, like, a good player will know the interaction between Arden and Skullclamp and never let your Arden hit the board, like stay on the board for any Mm -hmm. extended period of time. Um, That is a huge, like, that sucks, right? Uh, Bowmasters is a hard thing to deal with. With that being said, we do have the technology to save ourselves from it, right? Like, we have cards that are pretty good at protecting you, whether it's from just straight up giving your commander pro-black or just buffing it enough to the point where it's not, like profitable to target our commander with a bow masters um that is like one of the things where adding plus two plus two to your commander is really big um so it's one of the downsides like again i think uh very similarly to like uh tim necrom and rogsai it does struggle through a cage uh mm-hmm. craft diggers cage hits a lot of the t- like a lot of the decks in the format, not even the, just the top decks, just a lot of decks in this format, pretty harshly. Um, so, like a cage is just like a you like a just generically good stacks piece right now to play. Um, a curse totem you don't really care about unless you're trying to do the retainers line, in which case it's a little weird, mm-hmm. but. Ultimately, it's not a huge deal because a lot of times there, there's two situations where you're going to run into. One of two things is going to happen. Either one, you have what most people do is they just go, oh, well, I'll just give you the go yeah. And then you're like, bet. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, perfect. This is everything is going exactly as planned. <laughs> if they're savvy, they'll give you the loyal retainers if there's a cursed totem out. Which is rough, but that now means that your only obstacle to winning is removal totem. for the cursed totem. And so it, again, makes it so that this package that you, we've kind of developed in this is built in a way so that you can find that window of, okay, I think I can get rid of this cursed totem safely. Okay, I'm going to do that. All right, now it's time to, all right, let's go. And... That is something that, again, like every deck in this format needs to be able to do is find see the window and pounce. And that is one of the things where there's a couple stacks pieces that see play that are a little disruptive and just make you have to be a little bit more mindful. 
the same can be said for every other deck of the format though right um but i i i genuinely think like bowmasters is the biggest like hurdle is learn like figuring out how to play around a bowmasters is probably the most difficult part of it and i think that's also why i have moved away from the strategy of land and arden like as fast as you can mm -hmm. to pivoting to the strategy of value engine backup value engine and then right. use my commanders for the value that they are uh, naturally as the game progresses. And I think that strategy plays into this metagame a lot better. So what does a good opening hand with Arden Krom look like? Uh, again, uh, you, you really want to be able to have a little bit of acceleration. I think most decks in this format, if you aren't able to play some amount of acceleration on turn one, you're going to be noticeably behind the rest of the table right um if you can't get that like it, it really depends on your turn where you are in turn or like this is the thing about mulligans that i think it's very hard is it's hard to give like blanket mulligan advice right because it's like okay in in other formats you could just say okay if you're going first is what you're looking for if you're on the play then, or if you're on the draw then you do this where this is it, your mulligans look very different if you're going first, second, third, or fourth. They all look different. So mm -hmm. it's really hard to, like, give a great idea. But, like, generally speaking, like I said, you want to be looking for a value engine, some sort of, uh, like, ramp, whether that is quick. You know, we write a flame out of talisman. You know what, fam? You got it. You, you are doing better than most uh, can do in early game right so you want to do something like that um because of the fact that like you don't get access to dark like honestly a huge thing that sucks about this is you don't get access to dark ritual uh dark ritual is so good right now yeah. and losing access to dark ritual takes you off a lot of lines and uh like right of flame is like the best fill in in the colors i hate the card personally um, I never but, would have guessed listening to the Mind Sculptors. Yeah, if you've week. ever listened to the Mind Sculptors, I think it's a terrible. Like, I, I don't think it's a terrible card. I think it is. It, it, I have to take my own. I have to take my own advice, and I had to eat my fruits and vegetables. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I don't like it, but I got to do it, and it's just like the floor for the card sucks. It does have an incredibly high ceiling, where if you're in the right pod, you can get like a stupid amount of value off of a ri good ride of flame but generally speaking it's for two and even if your opening hand is land ride of flame talisman you're doing good you're you're in a decent spot depending on turn order again like if you're going last mm -hmm. and that's your hand i'd mulligan harder uh you, you need more than that bud uh, in fact, I would mulligan pretty aggressively for a Ristic Study or a Trouble in Pairs. You you got to get some some real card draw going. Um, but that's that's one of the things where it's like there's going to be opening hands where you're just going to be like, okay, I'm going first. Here's a Mystic Remora. Figure it out. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> the, the, I don't need acceleration because you're going to do that for me. And it's just... Like, that's one of the things that is unique about decks in blue is you get, like, the the access to Mystic Remora and Rhystic Study is just mm, so good. Mm -hmm. So good. All right. So with a basic understanding, and again, I understand, it's hard to kind of give Mulligan advice for, even we didn't even talk about pod composition with it. Yeah. So... I understand that. But basically, yeah. so, some amount of acceleration, you're not necessarily beelining to make sure you have that turn one Arden that's not yeah. really what the deck's about. It's about trying to make sure that you are able to establish your resource engine mm -hmm. and to be able to feed you the cards you need because exactly. you're, you're going to be the police. And, and that's a really good way of putting it because there will be tables where Arden is the resource engine, right? right. There are going to be times where... A turn one Arden with a skull clamp is going to put in a lot of work. I have had games where I have done that, and it just I, it runs the entire game. It, it completely takes over a game. Uh, because it, it's kind of similar to Bowmasters in that way, where like once you land it and get it going and it hangs around, the game stops being about everything else and now starts being around how do we play around this. And that is a very good thing to have. But there are going to be other games where you're just like, man... 
this ain't doing jack <laughs> so it's just like <laughs> you, you got to be able to read your table but again like you said some uh resource engine whether that's arden whether that's chrome whether that's ristic study one of them uh something like that and another piece that i like to have in hand generally speaking is something that isn't necessarily going to stop somebody but some amount of disruption right okay. whether that is you know a spell snare or stubborn denial or an offer or like a one mana counter spell right mm -hmm. or if it's something like blind obedience or dauntless dismantler like those are really good on turn one also so it's just like again it, it's very like one of those things where you having those things where okay if i don't be if i'm not able to accelerate fast can i at least disrupt my d opponent so i'm not nine years behind them right okay and so that's where you know getting the dauntless dismantler or the blind obedience or the you know a draneth or any sort of those things are really good at kind of stumbling your opponents a little bit because it kind of gives you time to get back into things and Le uh, last month was azorius month on gemstone mine and one of the mantras we got going talking with dj was first don't lose yes that's very and if you've got if you've got enough value in your deck everything else will follow from that if you just first don't lose yes i mean a, a lot of a lot of what Tivit and Timnacrom is, is just not losing until you have an opportunity to win. Right. And that sounds really like, oh, well, duh, Cal, that's what all of magic is. But, but truly speaking, like, if you think about it, like, those are decks that are built to just kind of sit there and just, like, make sure no fires catch, mm -hmm. deal with all of that. And then, oh, there's a window. All right, let's go. And this is very much a similar deck in that in that regard. Awesome. Okay, so let's make one last pitch here okay. to the to the CDH curious player mm -hmm. who's never picked up a CDH deck before. Who's like, well, I don't know. I've listened to a couple of other episodes. Is this really a deck that would appeal to me? Okay. Sell Arden Crom to this hypothetical person. Okay. Uh, so my elevator pitch is. You want to try out some of the best stuff in the format, but you also want to do something that's a little bit different, right? You want to be playing something that is more familiar, or you want to play something that attacks at a different angle, because like that's something that I, I know even for me, like casually speaking, people like, right? People like to do things that are unique. Um, if you like that, but also want that reliability, uh, this is a great, great idea. Uh, that is one of the biggest issues I have with like new uh, introducing new players to some decks is there are a lot of new decks where, or, uh, like cool, unique decks where you gotta be okay with losing a lot <laughs> because it's gonna be and just generally in CDH, you have to be, but like the more fringe you get, the more okay you have to be with that because it's gonna happen a lot. The f more fringe you get. Um, and then like you will eventually break through, but it's not going to be fun at the start of it. This lets you kind of sit on that outside barrier of, it's kind of like you're sitting on the edge of the like half pipe. Right. And you, so just so you can kind of get a feel for what, how deep it really is, because this has a lot of the stuff that you see in a normal CEDH deck. You're going like, honestly, a lot of this is like, a lot of Timnacrom, a lot of Tivit is this. Like, this is very much that deck in this. Um, a lot of the same DNA. But the big difference comes down to, oh, the, the, the little thing of, oh, I get to also play my, this really cool sort of Fire and Ice that I've had for 10 years. And uh, that that's also a fun angle with it. So if, if you like swords and uh, you miss the days of playing uh, Stoneblade and Legacy... Uh, this is a great deck for you because you're going to be able to play a lot of the best cards in the format and also some of the best legacy cards. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Callahan, thank you so much for taking time out yeah. of your day. I know you've been crazy busy over there. So one yeah. more time before we finish up, where can people find you online? 
Uh, so if you want to follow me personally on Twitter, uh, the best place to follow me is at Callahan is here. Um, that is my handle on most social media sites. Uh, so if you want to follow me on, I don't really do much on Instagram, but I am there on Instagram and with that as well. Uh, and if you want to follow the Sculpty Boys or the Mind Sculptors more broadly, you can follow us at Sculpty Boys. And that's Sculpty B O I S because we're nice and inclusive. Be it boys with an I is inclusivity. Um, at least that's what my uh, non binary butt says. So, um, but yeah, that's if you want to follow me there, uh, you could do that. Um, and, you know, uh, obviously, like if you are interested in the format, like uh, our podcast, we do a lot of stuff talking about the format and what it looks like and what the best decks in the format are. And that's one of the things we do every month is we look at the uh, we give our top 10 best decks in the format for whatever month. And uh, we I do a data collection for EDH top 16, look at the every deck that was played in the month. And I go, all right here here's the numbers and here's my take on the numbers and that's another thing if you want to get just raw data you can follow my twitter because i also on twitter do a monthly uh, metagame breakdown where i just do some raw analysis without any of the spin attached to it that i do in the power rankings which is a lot of like my opinion on things uh but if you just want like raw data uh, i do a monthly breakdown it's my pinned tweet on my uh twitter at all times so you can Go check me out over at Callahan is here, and uh, that is a great place to get some new information on the format. Awesome. Well, Cal, thanks once again, and thank you out there for joining us today. If you like this episode, please, if we've earned it, give us the thumbs up. Give us the subscribe over here on CCO Media Group. Still getting settled in, and I really <laughs> appreciate all the support that we've been getting from everybody in the audience. You can also reach us on Twitter, where we are at GemstoneMindMTG. You can send us an email to GemstoneMindPodcast at gmail.com. And we're right here on YouTube over at CCO Media Group. Until next time, I'm John, and this is Gemstone Mind. <laughs>